Thanks very much. Um, I'll explain uh, Agua uh, in a few slides, uh, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation and, and how, how it's uh, organized and uh, its, its partners and members and so on. But uh, first, I, I'd really like to uh, begin um, by talking about the role of science uh, in, in, in the private sector in a period when the climate is shifting. And one of the really key gaps, I think, over the last 20 or 30 years has been how do we move from the, the science, between the information and data that science produces really into insight. And that's, that's very difficult. Scientists like myself have, are, are mostly irrelevant people. We, we, we work on our, our projects uh, that fit in in some small way to larger processes. Uh, we can be helpful, but we don't really have the answers ourselves. We have our, our own thing that we're doing. Um, and, uh, and so how is it that, uh, in, uh, we can move from some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the trends that we see in the science and actually find some useful information um, that can guide uh, future decisions. So uh, water, clearly, uh, is one of the, the key points, especially in some of the uh, global meetings for the past year or so, is embedded everywhere in the economy. Um, and we tend to think about uh, water is really represented in the first two or three points there. It's the water that you see, but really there's a whole water cycle uh, and it's very complex uh, and it's all being impacted by climate change. And often many parts of the economy tend to relate to one or two of those levels um, and, and have relationships with other parts of that cycle somewhat masked. So we think about uh, some key sectors like in energy, food and agriculture, uh, cities, uh, and uh, water is embedded in all of these. Uh, for instance, we, uh, in energy, we often very directly think about uh, water and hydropower. But uh, water is deeply embedded in many thermal uh, fuel sources. Um, food and agriculture, we think about, uh, uh, about uh, irrigation. But uh, uh, that irrigation is really based on kind of higher level uh, aspects, such as uh, seasonal monsoons. Um, Cities uh, are, are often uh, uh, deeply intertwined. They were one of the first major infrastructure uh, development projects of the last two centuries um, and developing uh, urban infrastructure around water. Um, the first formalization, really, of the kind of modern city that we think of. Uh, and of course, in biodiversity, water is often expressed through shifts uh, in the, uh, the, the location of where we find species, particular ecosystems, and the timing at which particular things happen. And often finance is absolutely critical to this process, but maybe a step remove. So it's even harder uh, if you're the farther to the right that you go to see where the water is on the left-hand side. And one of the few uh, points that's often really missed if, if, you, if you're just focused on the liquid bits of the water is uh, that the whole of the water cycle is being altered. Uh, as a result of climate change. And it's not being altered equally or, or in the same way uh, in, in particular places. So this is a, kind of the standard image. It's from the US Geological Survey at a it's public domain. So people use this image over and over again. Um, and it, it uh, uh, represents just uh, like some of the really kinds of, of uh, like where water is present at any point on the globe. And some of those cycles are very, very deep. Um, so some groundwater storage uh, may, may represent um, fossil water that may be 10 or 20,000 years old. Um, one of the ways that we, uh, many of the categories in which we describe water actually mask uh, these differential impacts uh, across the water cycle. So we tend to focus very much, uh, uh, especially in economics and finance, but I think in many parts of the private sector, on talking about water at an annual scale. But that actually doesn't relate very well to the kind of water year. It doesn't relate to the kind of seasonality that's, that's actually occurring and can mask some of the really critical shifts that are occurring there. Um, water that's in uh, the farther down below the surface of the ground tends to be uh, buffered a little bit from climate change. It may be buffered from a matter of hours, uh, say for some municipal uh, storage um, and stormwater systems, uh, to many years. Uh, and, uh, and so fossil water is obviously not water that you're going to replace very easily, um, but, uh, but much water is on a 10 to multi-century scale. Uh, and snowpack and glacial fed systems, you know, there's a lot of 
press coverage around glacial systems, glaciers are, are, are primarily ice that's locked up for a really long time. It's like groundwater um, in that it's on long time scales, whereas snowpack is a seasonal uh, shift. So water is changing. Uh, and there's kind of three categories that I like to, uh, to, to describe generally. There's too little water, uh, there's too much water, and then there's water weirdness. Uh, so um, uh, we have some real problems with how we relate to this. We often assume that the, that the amount of, of water that's in a particular place or in a sector is fixed. And it's quite dynamic right now. Uh, it's always been dynamic, but it's in an accelerated dynamic uh, phase at this period. Um, changes uh, in the water cycle represent a new kind uh, of risk that is often not uh, uh, present or, or uh, very well accounted for in uh, the kinds of risk and opportunity screening tools. Um, there are some new tools that have been developed in the last few years that do help with that, but, but there are still gaps and risks. And these kinds of, of gaps uh, mean that it's really difficult often to, to predict. So scientists, uh, because they tend to focus on the information rather than the insight component, tend to wave our hands quite a bit. Uh, so and we, we feel very uncomfortable when we're really pressed. What's happening here at this time? So some very, very quick uh, examples. Uh, uh, too little water in Texas uh, just last year. Uh, there was a problem with um, coal-fired power plants providing a warning that if they didn't get rain in the next 30 days, they were going to shut down their coal-fired power plants because their cooling water, was uh, their, their reserves were too low. Too much? Um, uh, across the, uh, uh, the uh, well, right now, we have uh, uh, Isaac, uh, Tropical Storm Isaac, uh, hitting the U.S., but, um, but uh, the intensity of, of tropical cyclones generally uh, on a global scale is intensifying. We don't see more, but they're intensifying. Um, in South Asia, one of the most important things that I'll get to in the next slide is that the timing uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the monsoon appears to be shifting. It's weakening in effect. Um, some more, I, I think the, probably the most important part to focus on is really the, the weirdness aspect. So four very kind of quick snapshots from just the past couple of years. In Kenya, there's a, there's a lot of press coverage that talks about how uh, uh, they're in a drought. Well, most of Kenya has actually been receiving a little bit more rain in the last few years. The gap is that the farmers experience it as a drought because the timing of the, of the, of the rain has actually shifted by a couple of weeks. The Mississippi River uh, in 2011 during a very serious flood almost changed course. It was within probably three days or four days of actually jumping and moving several hundred kilometers to the west. Uh, we see some interesting conflicts between adaptation and mitigation. So uh, uh, electrical uh, infrastructure that's not capable of actually weathering a very uh, severe winter. Um, uh, 2012 has been a spectacular year for uh, big examples about water weirdness. Uh, uh, just in, from the past six weeks, um, three examples. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has just been warned uh, by the U.N. to prioritize corn uh, uh, in its drought-stricken region for food, especially uh, international food trade, rather than corn-based ethanol. Syria, there's been a, a steady drumbeat of, of papers that have actually related the Arab Spring in general, and particularly the mess in Syria, uh, to Syria uh, and much of the Middle East having one of its worst droughts in many, many uh, centuries that actually caused a very sudden transition uh, of a, a very rapid urbanization and a weakening of this price supports around food and energy. India. Of course, all of us heard about the, the 600 million uh, 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 person blackout. Um, well, that, again, relates to this idea of the weakening monsoon, the reliability, the timing, and the strength of the, the South Asian monsoon, which we, in, uh, in much of the, the Western press coverage, is really focused on, on decreased uh, uh, coal power generation. But the all kind of uh, driver that started a few months ago was really a de decreased hydropower generation. And because there was less water, the farmers fired up their, uh, their little diesel or electrical uh, generators for more groundwater pumping. So what are some of the science takeaways? Uh, weird weather is normal now. 
and you can expect a lot more strange with it. And we, in, in science, uh, the, the climate science is spectacularly weak about being able to tell us exactly what, what that's going to look like. And the farther that you get out, the, the, the less confident and more nervous we tend to get. Floods and droughts are both an issue. And they're often an issue in the same place. That's, a, that's something that the many people tend to focus on just one or the other. Um, and we need to, uh, in many cases, at the scale of much of the private sector activities, we need to think of water at a seasonal rather than an annual scale. Um, for a kind of longer term uh, uh, planning, there were some excellent points in the previous presentation about infrastructure that I really appreciated. You know, we need to, to think much more carefully about multiple scenarios, say over a five to 20 year period. Um, and downscale modeling the kind of IPCC uh, products it often are, are spectacularly bad about being able to provide significant guidance there. That's, we need to use a variety of other kinds of decision support mechanisms. Um, and the last point is, is, is really the past is no longer a very good guide to the future. That's what we scientists mean when we say non-stationarity. So uh, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, I co-chair that with uh, 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 the water anchor at the World Bank. We focus on a very practical action ar around uh, climate adaptation, operationalizing decision support uh, uh, from a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional perspective. We focus on, on really bringing expertise together to actually result in, in new institutional uh, practices. Um, the Agua Network is quite large, it's about two years old, and uh, is, includes about 34 organizations. Audio. So with that, uh, just quickly before we move into the meat and the substance, um, more substance than we've already had, which is a very good introduction and overview of our discussion today, I just wanted to take a few minutes to um, introduce a few concepts in a little bit more detail to kind of put some framing around our discussions. And I'll, I'll do this just by explaining C CI's approach at a very high level on climate change because it draws out some of the terminology that we're, we're all using in this discussion um, and helps me to, to illustrate a few points. So, um, you know, CI's really focused when it comes to climate change on taking a nature-based approach uh, in terms of demonstrating the important role that ecosystems can play in mitigating and adapting to climate change impacts. Um, our goal is uh, really dual focused on those two aspects, to curb emissions and adapt to change. Um, in terms of the solution that we um, provide and promote, it's uh, really one of developing resilience through protecting ecosystems. Um, and, and then our, our strategy really is one of cross-sectoral collaboration. Um, and I, I just wanted to bring this up for a few reasons. Uh, one, as I mentioned, the, the terminology, mitigation, adaptation, resilience are, are terms I think we're going to be using a lot today. Um, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about um, uh, just this cross-sectoral approach uh, to climate change, since that also will be a theme of our discussion today. Uh, within CI, we look across a range of, of different industries, um, including food and ag, uh, finance, and um, as, as Fred mentioned in my biography, we also focus on the extractives and more cross-cutting industries like, like water. Um, so I, I just wanted to take a quick poll uh, of the room how many people in the room feel that they have a good understanding of what those three terms mean, mitigation, adaptation, and resilience, by show of hands? OK. Um, so maybe, maybe two-thirds of the room. We are a room of experts, so perhaps that's to be expected. Um, I, I will say uh, I, I'd encourage you to listen for how those terms are used in the upcoming panels. In my um, helping to prepare for the discussions today, I heard a lot of different interpretations of what adaptation means for individual companies and from one sector to the next. And there is some convergence on definition, but there's also some divergence. And um, I thought that was really interesting, not necessarily something I expected, but um, I think that will be one of the challenges we face as we move forward. Um, and then just also to point out, in terms of the, the approach that the environmental community takes to adaptation, um, it, 
it's made us a little bit uncomfortable to really um, work on this approach until more recently, especially when it comes to engaging the private sector. Uh, it's almost as if we're admitting defeat when we talk about adapting to climate change, uh, as opposed to focusing on the mitigation, especially in our work with companies. Um, because first and foremost, we believe that, you know, uh, Companies really need to be looking for efficiencies. It makes business sense for them to be doing that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, so we don't want to, that to be forgotten in the whole mix, but I think perhaps that's why this adaptation discussion and some of these definitional issues are coming up because we're just kind of beginning to all feel comfortable that this is something that we need to be talking about. I just want to use an illustrative example. I think they're uh, often more helpful than speaking in generalities uh, in terms of how CI works on adaptation with companies. Um, use this example of our partnership with Starbucks. Um, uh because um, it, it's really, I think, a good illustration of a lot of the, the different terminology I mentioned on the last slide uh, comes together in, um, in, in uh, one company's approach to the issue. So um, uh, CI's been working with Starbucks for 14 years on integrating um, sustainable agricultural practices uh, into their supplier sourcing guidelines, their CAFE guidelines, as they're called. Um, and so that works across a range of environmental and social issues. Uh, water is, is, is integrated into the environmental aspects of those purchasing guidelines. Uh, we're also really focused on um, the opportunity side um, for farmers um, uh, and for the company looking at uh, creating new income streams and, and capacity for farmers, especially at the smallholder level. Um, and I should just mention that we have some materials on the table there if you'd like more information about our approach on that. Um, but the, the partnership has been more recently expanded um, to also look at implementing an approach on climate change adaptation um, that includes water. So um, really thinking about um, uh, landscapes where the company is sourcing um, coffee and thinking about uh, based upon um, what they're actually experiencing on the ground there and projections, how are, um, for example, precipitation patterns likely to change and what does that mean for coffee growing regions and for the, the farmers that are currently providing uh, coffee in those areas. I think I'm stuck. There we go. So, um, just wanted to mention briefly, this is, as Fred mentioned, our relative structure. We're going to break up the rest of our session for the day in three different industries, uh, focus in on finance and banking. And um, uh, really, I think that industry is still primarily looking at the, the risk side of things, but um, I'm sure would be happy to identify some opportunities within um, uh, this discussion on um, climate change and adapting. Um, as well, uh, we'll be focusing in on uh, infrastructure, specifically um, the, the water and, and ener energy industries, and uh, looking at some of the challenges and we hope also opportunities that those industries face uh, as they're adapting to a changing climate. And then finally, we'll focus in on the, the food and beverage industry. Um, of course, that's the, the very front end, but they have a whole value chain um, and efforts to address climate change um, and, and risks and opportunities associated with that uh, and adapting to that from field to market. So finally, my last slide, um, I just wanted to touch briefly on uh, what I hope is collectively from the conveners, uh, we've, we've talked about some of these issues, some of the desired outcomes for this session. Um, I think that uh, based upon uh, my last few slides th that we, we really hope to develop a more common understanding of some of uh, these concepts, adaptation and resilience that we're looking to discuss and mitigation and how they all interrelate, uh, or at least um, develop a greater awareness uh, about where the definitions converge and diverge. Um, and then also hoping to really illuminate and draw out what some of the business risks, but really opportunities. We've talked a lot about risks, I think, as a community over the past several years. And um, it's really important, I think, as well to uh, think about business opportunities um, if, if, if we're all looking to make a change. Um, uh, and, and, and also really thinking about what the business community needs to enable action 
um, to start um, addressing some of these issues. And then finally, um, uh, I hope to hear some um, discussion of what some opportunities might be for further work and collaboration to start uh, really actively engaging and, and addressing some of these issues. So with that, thank you very much. And I think we have time maybe for a few questions. Thank you, Marielle. Uh, we will take uh, about five minutes for questions. We are uh, running a bit late, but that's because we started late. We actually have a good cushion for the break, so we'll, uh, we're, we're fine in terms of uh, overall time, and we'll make the award ceremony. Uh, any questions for our panelists, any, any, any of the three? Clarification, insights, questions, or comments? Most welcome. All right, total clarity, here we go. I'm uh, Gita Esmier from Société Générale. So I had a question for Thierry, if um, I may. Um, if um, you could specify and get come back to the idea of the cycle of uh, which present opportunities for um, for investment, etc., for uh, as to water, because um, as part of a um, uh, member of the. Uh, uh, finance community, we uh, some of us are convinced that it's good to have products or investment products, but uh, we are not uh, quite uh, convinced that we are able to uh, market them properly and to have the demand on the other side, even if we have the product. Well, it's. For the financing and for industry, it's a central issue. We all know that when we go for a project, doing a DCF with common expected return of 15%, everything which happens after eight to 10 years doesn't matter. In the meantime, we all know that whether water or energy industry, investment will last 40, 50, even more years. The opportunity relates in the fact that these investments are due to last this long time, which correspond to something in which we can see that the change in climate will become significant and uh, uh, need, need to be addressed. The issue is that the financial community is still dominantly dealing with this more sh short-term return. So the gap to close today is which kind of business model can we develop to take more into account the long-term dimension where climate change and related effect and investment are related versus the short-term return which do not include the climate change and consequently do not see the benefit of this new technology. And that's where uh, there is some work to do. We know that a number of banks, whether a private bank like you or development banks, are, are thinking, how can we do it? And obviously, models are progressing in this regard. But it's, in the meantime, an opportunity, because you have this uh, cycle going well together. But how to, to do it needs a change of the financial community, which is not yet there. Uh, in a significant way, I would say. So, opportunity, but still challenges. Thank you very much. Uh, please. Yes, uh, just uh, following on from that, uh, I, my name is uh, Anya Dowling, and I'm a human ecologist, and I'm very interested in this you know, shift in consciousness and awareness from the quarterly financial report or the, the annual report, the annual meeting where one responds back to the shareholders, and this is how much profit, and you know, perhaps a one to five year window at the most. <laughs> Whereas what we're looking at is, you know, large cyclical change where we, we really need to, you know, be planning for how we're going to, you know, talk about to the next generation and to our grandchildren about, you know, what we did and the money we made and the integrity that we preserved as we continue to stay in business rather than the fact that we went for the opportunities of adaptation but didn't at the same time put major effort into mitigation. 
because I mean you started off very provocatively, you know, for a good reason. I think you know, and there there is there is some sort of tension here between you know seeking for profit while still not putting all the the effort that's required into the mitigative aspect. So you know, I think this is re you know, really really key. You know, how to move the awareness of shareholders forward that there are fantastic you know profit opportunities here, but we have to sort of do it within with a response to a moral compass and to sort of to name, you know, the opportunity. If one does respond to a moral compass, then the it's perfectly okay to move into, you know, ma looking for major profit in a 10 to 15 or 20 or 30 year cycle, at least from to until 2050. And to, to you know, it's just sh moving the time frame, the dimension. And, you know, how we do that for, you know, shareholders, I think is a, you know, there needs to be more discussion on that. That's a very thoughtful yeah. comment. Uh, any responses? Um, I, I like to say that uh, the science is actually uh, relatively clear on uh, the distinction between uh, mitigation and adaptation in terms of priorities. Um, we, um, uh, I, I like to, to describe that difference uh, in, in that good mitigation is the difference uh, between um, your grandchildren hating you and your great-grandchildren hating you. Um, so the, the, the mitigation efforts right now uh, are really about things that will happen at the end of this century. Uh, it's slowing uh, processes many decades from now when most of us will be gone. Um, uh, adaptation is about tomorrow, but it's also about right now. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, it, that's a very, very different kind of orientation. So we, we, we know we have to do a lot of uh, adaptation, and we need to do it fairly rapidly. Um, but mitigation is really a kind of a more strategic issue at this point. Not not to uh, underplay it, because it's very complicated and very challenging, but just in terms of the amount of carbon that we've front-loaded into the atmosphere and the amount of change that we're already committed to. Thank you for those thoughtful interventions. We'll take one more from... A, a, a quick comment yep. on, on the mitigation. Uh, WCSD recently published a paper where we recognize that research says that without a carbon price out of the range from $100 to $200, mitigation and the goals will not be achieved. And it has been a challenge for WCSD members to sign this with the appropriate wording, but we achieve it and thanks to CEO's push to go in this direction. And clearly, uh, mitigation in the view of WCSD members at least is clearly totally associated with the opportunity of uh, resilience. And uh, there is ways, it's not for, for tomorrow to have a $100 price of carbon, we all know that. But if we have that as an horizon, then both the past and this answer part of the investment issues as well uh, will go very well together and hopefully we will see result of mitigation before the end of the century. Excellent, thank you very much. Sir. Hi, thanks. Uh, Ken Bruder from Bloomberg. Uh, I appreciate all the comments that people have had, but I got to argue very forcefully against the uh, standardization or characterization that the entire financial community is short term focused. I mean, there's uh, communities within the financial community, sovereign funds, pension funds, insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera, who are taking a look at the longer term and are frustrated with this industry because of. Uh, the lack of clarity, the lack of transparency, and trying to understand what there, what there is. One of the things that we hear at Bloomberg is an intense interest in investing in this uh, space, but just a lack of understanding of it. So I, I would push back very, very forcefully on that, and I think we need to look introspectively at what we're doing as an industry to think about that. But uh, I have a broader question, which I just wanted to raise, and, and you know, one of the fundamental tenets in the water industry is that there's not a water price. And you know, a lot of activity mobilizes on its own when there is a water price. And so the question I would like to ask is, is should that be a goal that we should be thinking about, is putting a price on water? Or is it, you know, do we have to completely take that off the table and you know, concoct some other scheme to try and figure out how to put profit in this industry. Thank you, sir. Any, any takers? Mariel, Thierry? Well, on, on, 
to the first part of your question, I, we absolutely recognize there is number, a growing number of investors interested in long-term investment and industry at large as major effort to explain. And we have had, uh, in the GAG protocol type of discussion, many occasions to highlight the need to have industry CFOs able to discuss with the investment community in a more efficient way of the benefit of the long term and what is the action, and we know that. But it's, it's still, in, if you look at the whole uh, financial community, it's still a small part which are really, uh, but hopefully, and you are right, and I like your pushback, it's a growing part of it. Regarding the water price, it's a very complex issue and uh, because the water scarcity is totally different in one location to another. It's already priced in some part of the world, associated or not with a sanitation cost. It's not in other, for other use. So, and because of the different uh, cost of producing the resources to have one global price of water is something which is not meaningful. Uh, we, we all know that if you are in Canada or if you are in Saudi Arabia, uh, no way to have the same price for water. So how to do it? Very local issue. Could we have a general stance everywhere water should be priced uh, adequately to the local condition? Yes, nice. I have not said something different saying we should internalize externalities. But the way to do it depends so much of local political condition that the nice sentence, you can put it everywhere. The way to do it is where the challenge are. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I know we're running out of time, so I'll be really brief because I know we want to get into our financial community panel, which uh, might be able to talk about this a little bit more. But I, I just will say there are, um, I, I'm aware of at least one interesting model um, that Rio Tinto has adopted with respect to water. You're shaking your head like perhaps you're aware of it, but um, assigning an internal price to water within the company um, as a, a means to um, sort of uh, get at the issue that you've just um, addressed. And so I think it will be really interesting to see um, what that produces to the extent they're willing to share and if there are other companies that uh, begin to adopt that approach. Um, you know, I know companies, BP is one example, did that with carbon several years ago. Obviously a very different commodity and beast, uh, local versus uh, global in terms of um, uh, nature and nuance. But uh, um, I think that that was a pretty successful model for them. So I think it will be one really interesting trend with respect to water pricing to follow. Great. Thank you very much for those thoughtful questions. Please join me in, in, in thanking our speakers for the first set of uh, presentations. Thank you.